just to uh, give you a little bit of background, uh, I was here two years ago and presented an overview of a project that we had just started in Massachusetts, uh, which is my home state in uh, the United States. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the United States, uh, here's, here's the heck where Massachusetts is. Um, it is a, uh, the seventh smallest state by land size, but the third most densely populated. We have um, just a little over five million adults in Massachusetts, uh, which is equivalent more or less to uh, here in New Zealand, but clearly uh, a much smaller uh, geographic size. The um, Expanded Gaming Act, which was passed in November of 2011, allows for three uh, resort-style casinos to be built in three geographically distinct regions of the state. Uh, so far, two of the licenses have been awarded, uh, one here in the Boston area in a small town called Wynn. I'm sorry, uh, the, that's the operator is Wynn Resorts. Uh, the small town is called Everett. And then uh, here in the uh, western part of the state, uh, MGM uh, Resorts uh, will be building a nine and a half uh, $950 million resort in the city of Springfield. There is a Region C here, the southeast region, uh, where the Gaming Commission is uh, expected to make a decision on awarding a license uh, in March of this year. And the legislation allowed for one slot parlor, which was uh, awarded uh, and became operational in a small town, very small town of about 8,000 people here in the town of Plainville, Massachusetts. So casino le le legalization in Massachusetts took quite a few years to, to come about. Um, the discussions uh, began in 2007, but the legislation didn't actually pass until 2011. And so there was some form of casino uh, law that was considered in each of those years. And it was, as a result, uh, the legislators had time to look around as well as an interest in understanding best practices internationally. Uh, it probably didn't hurt that there were two prominent gambling researchers in the state, uh, myself and Howard Schaefer, um, as well as a very effective advocacy organization and in fact, one of the first places that I included my state legislators to look at uh, was New Zealand. And I actually trundled over a large pack of paper to, <laughs> with Senator Rosenberg and plopped it on the table at the cafe and said, you really need to look at this. Um, so there's a number of elements in the uh, Expanded Gaming Act that probably look very familiar uh, to the Kiwis in the audience. Um, the equal, equal importance given to minimizing and mitigating negative impacts, the strong voice of host communities, the public health approach to addressing problem gambling, the central role of research, and most uh, importantly, in my mind at least, uh, the, um, insur the insurance that there will be funds to address the impacts over time. So the Gaming Commission uh, is, is um, statutorily required to conduct an annual research agenda. Uh, that research agenda was launched in 2012, and the components currently include uh, the impact study, uh, the cohort study, a crime component, and an evaluation of responsible gambling activities. Um, the strategic plan for problem gambling services is actually um, not uh, officially part of the, um, the Gaming Commission's research agenda. It's being fielded or being developed by the uh, Massachusetts Department of Public Health. But the Gaming Commission is very involved and, and holds hands quite closely with the Massachusetts Department of Public Health in, in both the research agenda and um, in the development of problem gambling services. So this is a um, slide giving you an update from two years ago of what um, Amanda and I and all of our colleagues along with Rob um, have been up to. Uh, we completed the baseline population survey. Uh, we published a very comprehensive uh, descriptive report and we are um, in the process of doing multivariate 
analyses right now. Um, we have a baseline online panel survey uh, that we conducted in order to get a higher yield of problem gamblers to look at specifically at impacts in more detail. Uh, that is currently under analysis. Uh, we are, um, uh, our colleague Rosa Rodriguez Monguillo is a health economist in the School of Public Health and she is working on developing um, an understanding of the cost of services that are provided to pathological gamblers uh, in Massachusetts between 2009 and 2012. And we have these 10-year trends of social and health data uh, that are being published um, in interactive apps that you can access on our website. On the economic side, so that's the, that's the social and health side, and then on the economic side, uh, we have a forecasting model that is being populated uh, using um, uh, information from the licensees. We're using a matched comparison community approach to understand the impacts of the casinos on our host communities. Uh, we've, the economics team has developed uh, profiles of the economic and fiscal uh, characteristics of the host communities. Um, Mark Nichols, who's uh, a member of our economics team, is looking at impacts on lottery sales. Uh, we also have information on uh, the construction impacts of the slot parlor uh, that will be available soon. Uh, they're looking also at, uh, in, at uh, the, the creation of jobs in, in the slot parlor. Uh, and again, the 10-year trends um, are being published in interactive apps. I'm not going to spend any time on this. I see that I got the number of the sample size wrong in my uh, quest to finish these, sample, these slides last night. Uh, and Rob gave a very good uh, presentation about magic already. These are some additional components that the Gaming Commission has adopted as part of its uh, research agenda. Um, this uh, crime component is, uh, is, is actually, in, in my opinion, pretty unique. Uh, the Gaming Commission has hired a crime analyst uh, and he has um, negotiated with the police chiefs in each of the host and surrounding communities, so far just of the slot parlor, but ultimately it's going to be for all of the casinos, um, quarterly updates on all of the incidents that police officers respond to uh, in those host and surrounding communities every day. So he gets quarterly reports and then he provides a quarterly analysis of those data in order to allow for the timely deployment of local police resources in those communities. Now, that level of detail is, is more than we can even begin to imagine dealing with in terms of our impact study, uh, but we are working with Christopher Bruce, the crime analyst, to obtain um, higher geography data that um, we're going to be analyzing going forward. There's also an evaluation of responsible gambling efforts uh, the Gaming Commission published a, um, a responsible gambling framework about a year and a half ago, and as part of that framework, uh, they have required their uh, licensees to uh, undertake efforts in these areas. Um, the Voluntary Self-Exclusion Program is managed by the Gaming Commission, uh, not by the licensees. Uh, there are uh, mandated responsible gambling information centers in the gaming venues, and the Gaming Commission has um, licensed uh, GameSense, which is a, um, a, a, pro a program that, is, uh, that was developed in British Columbia to implement in Massachusetts. And then finally, there is an evaluation underway of the play management system, which is going to be offered to all loyalty card customers in each of the three or four um, uh, gaming uh, venues. Uh, that evaluation was contracted to the Division on Addictions, um, and we were specifically asked not to uh, apply for that project. I'm going to turn this over now uh, to Amanda uh, Haupt, who is our project manager for uh, both the Sigma and Magic Studies, and Amanda's going to talk a little bit about the strategic plan that the Department of Public Health is developing but in more detail about some of the research activities from our project that have fed into that strategic plan. Great. Amanda? Thanks, Rachel. Um, everybody can hear me, yes? 
I'll talk loud. Um, so hi, everybody. So Rachel gave you an overview of the project. And I think that one of the things that that overview illustrates is there are a ton of moving parts and a lot of different players. It's very complex. So one of the things that we thought that we would do today is just give you sort of a case study in that complexity and the amount of collaboration that's been required that both will give you a sense of some of what we've done on the research side of things, but will also sort of give you a sense of some of the complexities of those collaborative relationships. So um, the thing that we're gonna focus on is the strategic plan for problem gambling services. When the research mandate, um, when the legislation passed and we learned of the research mandate, one of the things that was clear is that a, a key part of the baseline study was going to be understanding problem gambling prevention and treatment services in Massachusetts and evaluating them. So when our team um, launched the, the project, we began doing this evaluation of problem gambling services. We created research questions. We started thinking about the data that we were going to need to answer these research questions. And one of the things that we found pretty early on is that there was a total lack of, of existing data about how many people had sought services, how happy they were with services, if those services had been effective. We had a real blind spot in terms of our awareness of, of what was going on in the prevention and treatment um, sort of uh, sector in, in Massachusetts. So, um, so we started having to get creative about, about what different types of data we were going to use to answer these questions. We knew that we were going to have access to our own survey data and a lot of secondary data, but we also knew that we were gonna have to form some partnerships with people who had been active in the industry to understand, uh, to understand how prevention treatment services had been sort of administered in the state. Concurrent to all of this, uh, the Department of Public Health in the state of Massachusetts decided to contract with an outside group of investigators to do a strategic plan for problem gambling services. And this group is excellent, and they do excellent work, but they don't have any background in gambling. And one of the things that you need to do a strategic plan is a lot of data. So one of the things that we faced early on is being really early on in our evaluation, experiencing this dearth of data, but then needing to share a bunch of data and information with this group of strategic planners. So it required constant communication and uh, collaboration. We had to share preliminary findings when they were really preliminary and we weren't that comfortable with sharing them and have a lot of dialogue with these state strategic planners. Um, so one of the things that we started doing was having early dialogues with the state strategic planners about the different activities that we were doing. The first of these was uh, the baseline population survey that Rachel just told you about that we did. We also had gained access to a bunch of data from the Massachusetts Council uh, on Compulsive Gambling's Problem Gambling Helpline. And then we decided to um, do an online focus group with treatment providers. All of these activities were underway when the strategic plan sort of launched, the whole process of strategic planning. So, um, so we had to sort of be in step with them as we were doing this. And as preliminary findings became available, we had to share them as soon as possible. What we ultimately decided to do um, in terms of making recommendations for the, the strategic plan at this early stage in the game was to put together a white paper with some of our preliminary findings and make some recommendations about um, the possible implications that these findings might have for strategic planners. As a research team, this has made us a little bit nervous because we um, were very early on in the process. These findings are preliminary. They're based on univariate analysis. A lot of it's qualitative data. So it made us feel nervous to begin sharing our findings. But the white paper felt like a nice way to be able to share some preliminary findings and also give some context. So I wanted to share just a few of the findings that we included in the white paper. This is gonna be a kind of quick and dirty run through of our data. One of the general things that we found is that um, adults in Massachusetts have rather moderate attitudes about gambling availability and the impacts of, of problem gambling and of, of gambling itself. So uh, the majority of people, almost 60%, felt that some uh, forms of gambling should be legal and some should be illegal. There were very few on the tail ends that sort of felt that everything should be, uh, that all gambling activities should be illegal. So some moderate attitudes there. Um, also moderate attitudes when it comes to impact. You can see there's sort of a spread of different attitudes. The majority of Massachusetts uh, adults reported um, thinking that the impact of the introduction of new gaming venues would either be neutral or have some kind of uh, beneficial impact on the state. So moderate attitudes. We also saw that, uh, that these moderate attitudes sort of combined with high rates of gambling participation. So overall, over 70% of Massachusetts adults had reported engaging in some type of gambling activity in the past year. Lottery, uh, raffles, and casino were the most form in, uh, common forms of gambling that were, um, that were identified. And we were able to see when we drilled out in the data some demographic differences in, um, in participation. We found uh, a problem gambling prevalence rate of 1.7% and an at-risk gambling uh, problem gambling rate 
of 7.5%, uh, and we found some demographic differences within these different groups. Um, we also found, we took a little bit of a, a look at awareness of media campaigns and programs to prevent problem gambling and found relatively low rates of problem gambling prevention and programmatic awareness in the state. So individuals were more aware, Massachusetts adults were more aware of media campaigns to prevent problem gambling, but much less aware of non-media programs. When we started asking about help seeking and treatment seeking, those numbers were even lower. In fact, the number of people in our survey sample who reported desiring or seeking help for a gambling problem, they were so low, those rates, that we were not actually able to report or publish them. So we looked beyond our data to other data sources that might be able to tell us about help seekers in the state and sort of the, the state of, of prevention and treatment service prevention. We looked to the Mass Council. Uh, we got access to like 20 years of data and just focused on the last five years of data. What we found is within the past five years, um, calls to the Mass Council's helpline dramatically decreased. And over the same five year period, uh, hits to their website increased, indicating that help seekers might be seeking resources online, which wasn't surprising. Um, there were a lot of, there was a lot of missing data within the data set. Uh, things that we know are that the majority of callers who sought help were, um, were gamblers, while the rest, a sort of smaller number, were still concerned about somebody else's gambling, most often um, relatives, family members, things like that. Um, and there were other sort of trends in who these help seekers were. The most common reasons for, for people seeking help that reported to the helpline were financial issues and relationship issues. They were dealing with some kind of relationship breakdown or they had gotten into sort of a situation of dire financial straits and that's why they were reaching out to the helpline. So we sort of took these findings, these are very different samples, you can't combine them, but in order to sort of understand a little bit more about this population of help seekers and treatment seekers that we couldn't really understand from our own baseline survey work. In addition to this, we um, did an online focus group with uh, treatment providers, and we found uh, a number of different sort of qualitative findings about, uh, about providers in the state. They reported using a variety of different screening tools in a variety of different ways. There were very few endorsements of common instruments um, or, or validated scales. Providers uh, reported treat setting treatment goals and evaluating outcomes in very different ways, a multitude of different ways. They really differed in their opinions regarding treatment goals and outcomes and treatment modalities and they identified a number of unmet needs, a desire for more skills-based and clinical training, a desire to be a part of a community of practice, a desire for clinical supervision and mentorship, greater ability to track, evaluate, and improve client outcomes, and they wanted more funding to do outreach to, ways, uh, to raise awareness about available services. So basically what we did is we um, put together a white paper that suggested three priority activities for state strategic planners at this early stage in the game, which is to utilize the findings presented in the white paper and which I've just presented to you now to tailor prevention messages and target outreach efforts. Even at this early stage in our analyses of these data, there are some um, findings that can be used to tailor prevention messages. Um, we also recommended that strategic planners consider improving data collection about individuals who seek help or treatment for a gambling problem. All the data sources that we have, none of them are giving us that number of how many people came in for services, how they felt about those services, how effective those services were in meeting their need. Lastly, um, we recommended that state strategic planners collect additional information to aid in selecting evidence-based and promising practices in problem gambling prevention, intervention and treatment, and that they adapt these practices for use in Massachusetts. One of the things that Rachel told you is there's a big gap in, in terms of licensing and when these venues are opening, and that gap of time really provides strategic planners with a lot of opportunity to look at what the evidence says and to adapt practices. So that's where I'll leave it uh, for you. I'm gonna skip through these last slides just so you can see our website. Um, I think that probably I'm going to open it up for questions, but this is where you can go to get additional information about the survey findings that I've presented. The full white paper and a huge report of our baseline findings are both presented there. And the shiny apps, which are cool. The little interactive web applications that shake up the data. Pretty Thanks. fun. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I would say that 
in addition to ourselves and Howard Schaefer's group, the Massachusetts Council on Compulsive Gambling has been a very effective advocate uh, for um, ensuring that uh, there is funding and build out of services for problem gamblers in Massachusetts. The, the Mass Council is, um, is one of the oldest uh, affiliates of the National Council on Problem Gambling. And they have been, they have been up and operating since the 1980s. Uh, they get most, or they got most of their funding initially, or so, so it was lottery funds originally that funded that, their activities. Um, but increasingly now, uh, it's looking like their funding is gonna, gonna be coming from uh, the Gaming Commission as well. <coughs> we stunned them all into submission <laughs> and talked really fast. <laughs> Hi, Nerely. Yeah, we actually have been dealing uh, with uh, the explosion uh, in some people's minds of what, what's called daily fantasy sports in Massachusetts. Um, you know, we were sort of like chunking along thinking, okay, we're looking at, uh, you know, casino impacts and we're going to be doing casino impacts and then suddenly out of left field, everybody has to find out something about daily fantasy sports. And did we ask questions about daily fantasy sports? And we're like, no, we didn't ask questions about daily fantasy sports. We will, of course, ask them now, um, but the, the, the legal situation of um, internet gambling in the United States, as I'm sure you are aware, is extremely uh, murky, and there is no explicit legislation in Massachusetts that, that says online gambling is illegal, there are federal statutes that prohibit payment for online gambling uh, to American citizens, uh, and Massachusetts falls under that as a U.S. state. Um, but there is now a white paper that the, that the Mass Gaming Commission has submitted to the Massachusetts legislature, uh, essentially saying, uh, you know, this, this daily fantasy sports issue has come up. Uh, we think it's an opportunity to sort of think about broader picture what might be the right approach to regulating online gambling, including daily fantasy sports and including all sports gambling online um, under a, a larger sort of consideration of what, what, is, what, what would be a good legislative framework for the regulation of online gambling in Massachusetts should the legislature decide to go down that road. So there is a study committee that's being set up right now. Um, I expect that uh, in the not distant future, uh, someone's gonna come knocking at our door and say, so what did you find out about online gambling while you were doing your surveys? So we, we're gonna be meeting to get ready for that. 